Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, and I'm so glad you decided to make us a part of your Saturday afternoon. I'm going to let you guys know right up front, um, it is the Labor Day weekend here in the U.S., and so we are not going to do a mailbag tomorrow. So there will be no AMC Mailbag on Sunday because we're taking the week, well, at least part of the weekend off. Um, so I'm just giving you that heads up right now. And uh, for those of you who don't know, if you're new to this show, this is the show where all we do is take your mailbag questions. It's a much more laid back, relaxed um, show than we do at AMC Movie Talk. We take your questions. We'll talk about a little bit of behind the scenes stuff going on at AMC as well. So I love doing this show. Now, as many of you have noticed before, I, have, I usually do this show alone. And it's, it's actually a bit of a hassle doing it all alone. So today... I am very excited and be pleased uh, to be joined by my friend Jocelyn Polite. Hey there. Who is who has graciously agreed to come in and help me do the show today. So thank you for being here, Jocelyn. Uh, you're welcome. This is great. It's a pleasure. Uh, we actually met um, a couple months ago mm -hmm. because I was uh, putting together a uh, True Blood after show for the stream and one of the things I had to do was cast people and I had we had I met there. Yes. But you informed me we had actually met before that a long time ago doing you something did. else, which I totally forgot about. Um, and uh, I thought she was fabulous and spectacular, so I cast her to be on the True Blood After Show, and she just knocks it out of the park on the True Blood After Show. So I asked her if she would come in and help me out with this today, and she said yes. Of course, I'm here. Yay! All right. <laughs> well, then, Jocelyn, why don't you get things kicked off for us? What is question number one? Okay, well, let's get it started with question number one. And question number one is from Felipe Roy. Felipe Roy writes, hey, guys, love the show. Which video game franchise would you like to see coming to the big screen first, Mass Effect or Halo? That is a which child do you love best kind of question. <laughs> uh, okay, well look, there, there's no Mass Effect has a really great storyline. Like I always criticize uh, video games and you know people who want to see video games brought to the big screen because I'll, I'll normally say, look. Video games are designed for gameplay. They're not designed for narrative. And even though you may feel like there's a lot of story um, and, and laid out uh, didactic narrative in a video game. There's really not. Mass Effect is one of those games, though, and we're seeing more and more of these, to be honest. We're seeing more and more of these pop up. Mass Effect is one of those games that there is a really great mythology to the game. If you've played it, you know it. They've got some really great characters in it. It could be very cool. That being said, I got to go with Halo. Um, Halo, and not necessarily because it's a better story or whatever. That's up for debate. So don't don't get bothered. Don't get your panties in a twist here. The the main reason I'm going to go with Halo on this is because Halo has that background that people have been dying for this movie for a long time. Now remember, about I don't know seven eight years ago, Peter Jackson, director of the Lord of the Rings films, he was brought on to executive produce and produce a Halo movie. He went out and got a script, and then he got a director involved. Why he wasn't directing himself, I have no idea. But he went out and got a director involved by the name of Neil Blomkamp, who went on to direct District 9. Um, and then it all fell apart. The studio started to pull out. They lost confidence in the film. They lost their financing. And despite Peter Jackson's putting on the brave face and saying, no, we're still going to get this movie made, it never got made and the, and the project eventually died. Because of that... I think I would want to see a Halo movie more just because we came close once. We had just that, we had it on the tip of our tongues. It was there. We got just a little taste and we were excited about it and we were pumped up for it. And we wanted to see it. And then it was so cruelly pulled away from us uh, at the very last second. And, you know, I, I think for any, for no other reason, that alone is enough for me to go, if I had to choose between a Mass Effect and a Halo film, and I'd, I'd like to see both, but as of right now, I want to see Halo because it feels like unfinished business. I feel like it's something we need to see uh, and we need to get this out of the way. So, yeah, like I said, if you're going to put a gun in my head and give me only a choice of one, that's the one I'm going to take. All right, Justin, what else do we got? All right. Well, let's move on to Michael Kramer. 
Michael Kramer writes, hi guys, I've been watching for almost two years now and I'm actually wearing my Sons of AMC shirt right now. Awesome, thank you, Michael. <laughs> That's great, Michael. I was wondering if you thought that Disney might ever revisit the Star Wars prequels by way of editing them into good movies. <laughs> I know people get upset when messing with old movies, but in this case, I think we would forgive them. <laughs> I've seen amateur cuts of The Phantom Menace and that made the movie quite bearable. <laughs> Do you think that we could see these movies ever get a redemption around in theaters? Um, Here's the thing, okay, like first of all, I'm gonna acknowledge this. <clears throat> as much as I crap on the prequels, because they suck and are a complete abomination to creation itself, as much as I hate the prequels and I crap on them all the time, I should acknowledge that there are people out there who like the prequels, and that's awesome. If you're one of those people, um, that that's great. I'm glad somebody out there was able to get some enjoyment out of it, and that's great. And the fact that I hate them so much and think they're a travesty against humanity doesn't mean you should lessen your enjoyment of them in the least. So let me just acknowledge that right up front. But it, it is pretty much generally accepted that, that a lot of people really dislike the films. Obviously, I am one of them. There was a while ago this uh, version uh, of the prequels. I don't know if you ever had a chance to see these, Jocelyn. They, they were fly floating around. Maybe not. Not a lot of people saw them, but it was called The Phantom Edit. Had you ever heard of it? I've heard of it. I right. didn't see it. A lot of people heard of it, but it's almost like an urban legend, right? Mm -hmm. But it's real, my friends. It's real. Where somebody, I can't remember who, like took The Phantom Menace, or uh, took the Star Wars prequels and like edited it in such a way that they cut out all of Jar Jar Binks, they cut out all the midichlorian stuff. They cut out a lot of the young Anakin stuff and whatever. And they made like a cohesive movie out of all that, out of the remaining material, having taken all the rest of that out. And I'm going to tell you, it's a markedly better film. It is significantly better. So what uh, Michael is asking here is, do we think that like Lucasfilm itself should collect up those prequels, take the scalpel to them, re-edit them, reimagine them, if you will, and then re-put them back together into a, what Michael calls, a good movie. It's, it's certainly not a bad idea, but I'm going to say, no, I don't want it, and no, I don't think it'll ever happen. And I think they, I don't want it, and I don't think it'll ever happen for the same reason. And that reason is this. I don't want to be reminded about the prequels. And I think Disney and Lucasfilm at this point do not want to draw any attention. I don't think they want to let us remember anything about the prequels. I don't think in Star Wars Episode Seven. I think you are going to get a very rare reference to the prequels or anything that happened in the prequels. We're not going to see Gungans in Star Wars Episode Seven. We're not going to have, you know, Jar Jar Binks in Episode Seven. We're not, I don't believe we're going to have talk of midichlorians in Episode Seven. I think Disney is going to do as much as they can to distance themselves from the prequels. And as a fan of Star Wars, a live, breathe, die hard fan of Star Wars, I'm perfectly happy with that. I, I just want them to do what the Highlander 3 did. The Highlander 3 just pretended that Highlander 2 didn't exist. Because Highlander 2, one of the worst films ever, the Highlander 1, one of my all-time favorite films, and then the Highlander 3 came out, and it was strange because if you watch the Highlander 3, I think Mario Van Peebles is in that, actually. If you watch the Highlander 3, it just pretends that Highlander 2 doesn't even exist. They don't acknowledge anything or reference anything or, you know, anything that was a part of Highlander 2 just is wiped out of existence. They just don't acknowledge it at all. And I have a feeling that's what they're going to do with Star Wars Episode 7. At least I have my fingers crossed that that's what they're going to do. So I personally don't <laughs> think that, uh, that you're going to see them re-edit it. I mean, look, if Disney or Marvel uh, or Lucasfilm, I should say, put together their own phantom edit where they recut that movie and put it back together in a movie, would I, out of morbid, morbid curiosity, go to the theater and watch it? Yes. Yes, I would. Um, but I don't want them to do that. So I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and say no. I'm just going to, for now, I'm just going to say no. Did, um, did you ever have a chance to, to watch the prequels when you were a kid? Did I ever have the chance to watch yeah. the prequels? Um not really. I wasn't a bit. I liked exactly how it came out. I liked seeing it where it is. I'm not a big prequel person. Right. To be honest. I mean, what you give me, I trust that you're giving it to me for a reason. And <laughs> I like that. I mean, you know what I mean? I don't right. really need to go back to a character's childhood and see what's going on. I already have that going on in my head. I feel pretty creative. Uh, see, I knew I liked it. <laughs>
All right, let's get on to the next question. <laughs> okay, James Mitchell writes, I understand that post credit scenes are a bonus, but not something that films owe fans. However, with the great job Marvel has done using these to tie their universe together, am I the only one who takes the Guardians post credit scene as a small slap in the face? I get that it was intended to be casual and funny, but as a fan, I don't enjoy sitting through the credits just to see that. I would not have taken issue with it if they had incorporated a second scene that contained more substance as as they at the end of Thor 2. Am I just a spoiled fan or is my point somewhat valid? There's no validity. You are just spoiled. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think he's right. Um, look, I and everybody knows how much I love Guardians of the Galaxy. Actually, Jocelyn saw Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. with me the very first time I saw it. Yes, you and me yeah. were at the Disney lot and we went and watched it there. And as a matter of fact, they did not even show us the end credit scene when we went to go see it at the Disney lot. They didn't show it at the world premiere. They didn't show it at any of the press screenings. They really wanted to keep it under wraps. And I remember, I think I said to Jocelyn coming out, I said, hey, if they're not showing it to us now, that must mean it's pretty important. It's probably a pretty significant thing that happens in the end credit scene. And then, so I go back and watch it for the fourth time on opening day and stick around. I sit through the credits and sit through the credits and sit through the credits. And then finally the screen comes back on. It's like, okay, what's it going to be? And spoiler alert, it's, um, it's, it's the Howard the Duck thing. And I'll be honest with you, I hated it. Now look, everybody who watches the show, you know how much I totally love Guardians of the Galaxy. I've seen it seven times in theaters already. I'll probably see it again before it leaves. I just, I'm just i not saying it's the best movie of the year. I'm just saying I had a lot of fun watching that movie. I think James Gunn did a masterful job. But that being said, that doesn't mean I stick my head in the sand. That end credit scene was terrible. It, I mean, it. look, I can get it if a bunch of guys are sitting around in a boardroom and say, hey, what would be cool? What would be funny? And somebody says... Howard the Duck. That sounds funny. Okay, I kind of get it. But then once you put it together and you watch it, you got to realize this isn't worth asking our fans to sit around five or six minutes of credits for. This doesn't tie into the rest of the universe. This doesn't give us a sneak peek. Or at least we hope it doesn't. It doesn't give us a sneak peek into what's coming up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This is not worthy of a Marvel end credit scene. And while I will not say, I will not go so far as what James says, when James says, is this a smack in the face right. uh, to Marvel fans? No, I don't, do not believe this was Kevin Feige smacking us in the face. But that being said, I agree that it, it was, they let us down. Yes. In the words of Arrow, they have failed this city. Um, and and I, I believe this was a misstep. I really do. I think they could have done better. I think they should have done better. And if not better, then just don't have an end credit scene and, and don't don't sit have us sitting there in that empty theater when we've already been in there for two plus hours waiting to go to the bathroom. But wait, we got to hang in there for six more minutes through credits that we don't care about to see this big scene. And it was just a little throwaway gag. Um, yeah, I, I was disappointed by it. Doesn't take away from how great the movie is. But uh, for me personally, I was disappointed. So. Anyway. So I shouldn't feel so upset that we didn't see credits that, that night that we went no. to see it. No, <laughs> and I remember, if you remember, we saw that film and we were with a whole bunch of other movie journalists, right? In, yeah. this, in this crowded Disney theater on the Disney lot and everybody waited. We all waited. We they were waiting for it. We thought, like you'd think if they're not going to show the end credits, they would tell us in advance, hey guys, just so you know, we're not showing the end credits today. But they didn't tell us that. No. So we were all sitting around waiting, waiting, waiting. And then the final credit goes by and you're waiting for the screen to come up, but instead it goes black. It goes black, the curtains start going <laughs> together and we're like, what happened? And what? you hear everybody in the audience was like, yeah. what? It like, was there's total disappointment. Very disappointed. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, Chase Broad writes, long time viewer here, love the show. So I was thinking about <laughs> Avengers 2 and who might bite it. The big <laughs> guys are obviously exempt and I think we can rule out Widow for for need of female characters. I don't think we should assume Hawkeye's death either. From what I can tell, they plan on making him a much more involved player, thank goodness. <laughs> that would be a pretty cheap and expected kill anyway. With the inclusion of Rhodey, an established but expendable character, 
personally close to Ultron's character, is it a safe bet that Rhodey would be Whedon's sacrificial lamb? You know what? I think for a long time I was saying that I believe that, I, I did believe that Hawkeye was the logical choice to kill off. He's just an average human being. I mean, he's an exceptional human being, but he's just human. There's nothing super about him per se. Um, and they haven't really leveraged him or used him much. And I thought he makes the logical choice. I don't think it would have been a lazy kill to make Hawkeye the guy. That being said, clearly that's not the case. Because as we talked about on AMC Movie Talk this past week, Jeremy Renner in an interview kind of revealed that he thinks uh, Hawkeye is going to play a part in Captain America 3. Captain America 3, which comes after Avengers 2. And so it looks like, um, you know, Hawkeye being the guy that bites it is off the table. That's probably not going to be the case. And remember, there is nothing saying that anybody is going to die. I mean, the, Joss Sweden has not come out and said, yes, one of the key characters is going to die. He hasn't done that. We've all, everybody's just speculated that so much that it's kind of become fact amongst people. But remember, there is no fact saying that. I think it's likely one of the characters is going to die, but I don't think it's, it's an absolute certainty yet. That being said, let's assume for a second that Joss Whedon plans on, uh, you know, sticking the ceremonial knife into one of his own characters. Okay. That's a great theory. Rhodey? Rhodey? War Machine? Uh, Iron Patriot? Rhodey. That is a great theory because you're right. Rhodey's death would serve, would give dramatic purpose to the film. Because Ultron's creator is, of course, of course Tony Stark. And, you know, Iron Man, Rhodey's best friend. So if Iron Man, who creates Ultron, then has his own creation kill his best friend, that is a huge dramatic punch. That would be great. Now, we already know that uh, Rhodey is going to be in the, uh, in the movie. We know he's there. Uh, we've seen pictures of him there in Avengers Tower. So we know he's there. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, Look, nothing's set in stone, nothing's guaranteed, and I'm not willing to put money on it. But to have him die, to have Don Cheadle die, uh, in that serves great dramatic purpose. And if you know anything about Joss Whedon, while he is totally willing to sacrifice and kill off his own characters, he usually only does so when it serves dramatic purpose. The death of Rhodey would serve dramatic purpose without affecting the core team. I also wouldn't be surprised if one of the twins dies. Now, a lot of people think they're setting up Quicksilver and uh, Scarlet Witch uh, being played by Aaron Taylor Johnson and uh, 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 the third uh, the third twin, uh, Elizabeth. I'm for, why am I forgetting her name? Olsen, Elizabeth Olsen. Um, being played by Aaron Taylor Johnson and Elizabeth Olsen. Uh, a lot of people think they're going to be used to set up the Inhumans. I think that's a bit of a stretch, although I wouldn't bet against it completely necessarily. But I won't be surprised if one of those two, if one of the siblings actually bites it too. I, I think there could be a couple of people that fall to Ultron in this. And uh, But Rhodey, Diane, great theory, man. I love the way your head's thinking. I think that serves dramatic purpose. I think it sounds great. So uh, yeah, I'm all for it. Uh, well, well, what about you? Like you've seen Avengers. Do you, have, do you have any sort of theory about who might die in the next Avengers? Or who, let me ask you this. Who would you like to see die? Ah. Uh. I'm not sure. I, you know what? It's, it's funny. As I read that, I thought that is a good choice. I mean, that was a good question, and I think that's a good choice. Yeah, it, it, th that's a good one because we know that you know the top ones are not going to. I mean, we just know that off the bat. They're not going to kill Tony Stark. No They're way. not going to kill Captain America. Not going to happen. But I think Rhodey's a good choice. I mean, like you you can get married to the fact that you love this character, but at the same time, they can go as long yeah. as it's done in a really great creative way. Perfect. I'm okay with that. All right. What's next? All right, so we have Roman Bryant. Roman Bryant writes, Hey, AMC, love the show. Now, I know you all have gotten a lot of top five or ten questions. Now, John, once said that Gaston was one of his favorite Disney villains. I just wanted your top five. Thanks, and keep up the great show. Oh, what a guy that Gaston. <laughs> I love Gaston. I think he's a great character. Uh, so great in Beauty and the Beast. Um, I, I can't run down a top five. I can't off the top of my head. But I will say that that in the top five, these three would absolutely exist in, in whatever order. Number one would absolutely be Gaston. I'm not saying he'd be number one. I'm just saying the first guy I'll list off is Gaston. Uh, the, one of the other guys I would put in that top five has to be Scar. Scar from The Lion King, just voiced by Jeremy Irons. 
it, like just such an awesome character and like so creepy and underhanded and evil and conniving and just, and slick and smooth and like I said it's the voice of Jeremy Irons what more do you need that's so great um, I I might I said this was in no particular order but my number one might actually be Jafar um, because Jafar was like a huge threat a lot of times villains in films actually play a very small role in the film they only pop up when they need them Jafar was a very central character in Aladdin um, and played a, a great role. And they, of course, they did the straight to home video sequel uh, with Jafar that that was also actually pretty darn good for Disney straight to sequel movies or straight to home video movie sequels. But uh, I would probably say Jafar, because when you think of Jafar, too, you have to think of Gilbert Godfrey's parrot that goes along with Jafar and just together and combined. They're just an incredible pairing. Um, so I'm I'm gonna say I while I'm not gonna list three uh, or list five I will say three of them would have absolutely have to be uh, Gaston one would have to be Scar and one and probably the biggest one for me would probably have to be Jafar if I if I put it to you though mm. Jocelyn your favorite Disney villains who would you list off who would immediately come to mind Gosh I, I'm sitting here thinking of that and I'm like who who's the villain that just jumps out in my head. I don't even know. I mean, there's just so many. I mean, there's so many that I, I don't know. And as I was listening to you, I'm thinking those are some good picks because the voice was so strong. And, yeah, and, and every, yeah. that, that's those are really good picks. They really are. But I can't off the top of my head. I just can't. It's not there. It's not what's, coming. What's the name of the uh, Little Mermaid? Uh, is, it, is that Ursula? Ursula. Ursula was a good one. Yes, definitely. Obviously, uh, Maleficent. Is, oh, is a big one. Yeah. Even though they just kind of turned her into a hero in the live action movie of it, but yeah. Maleficent's a really good one. But if you know one. the true story, that's a really yeah. that's a very good one. Queen of Hearts from Alice in, Alice Wonderland, in Wonderland is a good one. Um, oh gosh, there's, there's probably a whole bunch it's more. It's a lot of them. I, yeah, there's oh, there's a ton of them. I'm going to be thinking about that one. Yeah, I, I will too. Yeah, and that's that's why I kind of get frustrated with top five questions because top five questions are really infuriating to me because it's like, uh, okay, I need like an hour to sit down and, and chart these out. But uh, but once again, for me, the three I would absolutely put in there, Gaston, Scar, and, and uh, of course, the aforementioned Jafar. Okay, what's next? All right, Harry Green writes, do you guys think that Sin City 2 would have been a huge success had Tarantino directed and or wrote the script? This just seems like a film he would do. You're absolutely right. It does. It, Sin City does feel like a film that Tarantino would do. Remember, Tarantino and the guy who did direct the film, Roderick Rodriguez, have worked together on a lot of things, not the least of which, of course, was Grindhouse, where they both directed one half of the Grindhouse film. So they share similar tastes and similar styles. I think it's pretty fair to say at this point, though, that Quentin Tarantino is the superior director. Even though I actually thought Robert Rodriguez's film in Grindhouse was better than Tarantino's film in Grindhouse, um... I think they're similar in style, similar in tone. You're right. Sin City is the type of movie that I would expect from a Tarantino. The reason I'm going to say no, it would not have been a hit film either way, unless they put it out like maybe seven years ago, um, is because even though a lot of us travel in movie-loving circles, we are very turned on by who is directing this and who wrote that script and all that kind of stuff. The vast majority of the movie-going audience simply doesn't care. Uh, they'll care about a name like Steven Spielberg. Uh, they might care about a name like Martin Scorsese. But for the most part, they do not care about who the director of a film is. Like, that, that's just the reality of it. Um, and I'm not saying nobody does, but I'm just saying the vast majority of the movie-going audience don't pay attention to who directed the film. They're more interested in who the star is, did the trailer look good, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, would Sin City 2 have been a better film? Probably. I'll go out. I'll go out on a limb and say probably Sin City Two would have been a better film had Tarantino written and directed it. But would it have been any less of a box office bomb? Honestly, I'm I'm honestly not sure one way or the other if it would have been or not. I mean, maybe it would have done a little bit better because word of mouth would have been a little bit better. But hey, did you have a chance to see the new Sin City? Um, I didn't see the new Sin City, but I I I I, I agree with you. Yeah, you and nobody I, else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wasn't. Yeah, I didn't want to see that one. But I. But honestly, I love Tarantino. Number one. I yeah. mean, That's just you know, and for the similar styles. I mean, we know the whole Tarantino and Rodriguez universe. I mean, that's right. just it is what it is, and the two of them have the similar style. Although I do like the way that Tarantino handles his hero women. You know, he yeah. has, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, and that's no disrespect to Frank Miller, you know, and Rodriguez with, with what they did with Sin City. I think they did a great job, but I love how Tarantino 
creates these kick-ass characters and these women mm -hmm. that just go out there and completely kick ass like in Kill Bill and at the same time th he doesn't lose their femininity and I, I know I'm coming from like the female perspective here but he, they don't lose their femininity with all of the ass right. kicking and the knives and the guns and everything like that so I think seeing that it probably would have been a little bit better of a movie with Tarantino that's just my opinion one on great example one. of that is my least favorite of all the Tarantino actually the only Tarantino film I will stand up and say I think this was a terrible movie the only one which was uh, uh, from *Death Till Dawn*? No, *Death*. Uh, th his half of *Grindhouse*. Death. Not Power. De um, death car. Uh, death. Uh, car death. No. <laughs> something. Death, death proof. Death proof. Thank you. That's the title of it. Uh, it's death proof. I did not like death proof at all. I thought death proof was terrible. But to your point, he's got the, the whole you know mini movie. It's not even a mini movie. The yeah. whole movie focuses on these three female protagonists, mm -hmm. or four really. Um, and he does a great job with them. So yeah, you're right. He really does a good job with those. Yeah. All right. Let us move on to the next question. Okay. Tony Kamara writes, I just finished watching today or yesterday's show, depending on when you read this. <laughs> there, was viewer quest there was a viewer question about the best actor, Jack Nicholson, Daniel Day-Lewis, and Tom Hanks. And I'm not taking anything away from DDL, but why doesn't Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Morgan Freeman, or even Denzel Washington ever get mentioned? Shouldn't they be considered? Um, well, remember, the question that came up, what he's talking about is on AMC Movie Talk earlier this past week, somebody asked the question, who's better, uh, Danny D. Lewis, Tom Hanks, or Jack Nicholson? It wasn't who's the best actor of all time, one of those three. And we all across the board say, well, Daniel Day-Lewis, because there's an argument to be made that Daniel Day-Lewis is the greatest actor ever uh, that's ever lived. Um, so, you know, what, what Tony is now asking, well, what about guys like Pacino, De Niro? Uh, what about guys like Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman? Um, let me just a couple of those names. Morgan Freeman, I, I don't think you put on that Mount Rushmore. He's a terrific actor. But he hasn't had enough opportunity, I think, to lead films, to be the lead person in a film and carry a film. Um, he's been a magnificent supporting actor in, in all the stuff, and he's won Oscars for doing that. But I don't know that you can get into the conversation of greatest actors ever for guys who are primarily, most of their careers have played supporting roles. Uh, and you can agree or disagree with that. I think there's a very cool debate to be had there on that. So that's totally cool if you disagree with that, that philosophy. Denzel is great. I don't think you're going to find anybody that doesn't say Denzel is great. Is Denzel all time great? I think there's an argument to be made uh, about whether he belongs up in that upper, 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 upper echelon um, of actors, uh, uh, you know, all time actors. I wouldn't put him up there necessarily yet. Um, but I think he, be I, I think for me personally, he belong. he's very firmly implanted in that next tier, just below all time. Great in, in the like legendary category, like there's legendaries and then there's all time great. And I think Denzel belongs in that legendary category, but I don't know that I'd put him in like the top 10 best actors of all time. Um, you know, I, I mean, look, seriously, if. If you're, if you're in a minority group like Denzel is and you're not even the best actor in your minority group right now, I don't think you can be considered in the top thing of all time. I, I personally think the best black actor working today is Chiwetel Ejiofor. That dude, that dude just exploded on the scene with me with Serenity like six or seven years ago. And ever since, whenever this dude is on screen, he owns it. Um, I actually thought, look, I have no problem with Matthew McConaughey winning the Academy Award for his... An incredible performance at Alice Byers Club. No complaint. But if it had been my vote, Chiwetel edgy of four for 12 Years a Slave. Chiwetel has, is just the man. He proves he's the man every single time he's on screen. So he's incredible. He's fantastic. Um, then you bring up like the two big names that often come up when talking about want to compare people to Daniel Day-Lewis. Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. And I'm going to say Pacino and De Niro aren't in the same class as Daniel Day-Lewis. And here's why. Now, before you get all mad, listen to me explain why before you break out the pitchforks, okay? At their best, Pacino and De Niro belong in the conversation with Daniel Day-Lewis. Absolutely. At their best. Al Pacino, I still think Al Pacino's best performance is in a movie I think most of you probably haven't seen, uh, is uh, Merchant of Venice when he plays Shylock. It, it, it was out only about six years ago. Very few people saw it. 
I think that is Al Pacino at his best. We've seen Robert De Niro in a couple of films that you could say this is Robert De Niro at his best. And at their best, Pacino, De Niro belong on that level with Daniel Day-Lewis. But here's the problem. For about 10 to 15 years now, Pacino and De Niro quite often have just mailed it in and have phoned it in. Um, they... And as many great, legendary, iconic, fantastic performances they have given in the past 15 years or so, they have turned in some real stinkers at the same time. You juxtapose that against a Daniel Day-Lewis, who every single time, without exception, there is not one even remotely weak performance that Daniel Day-Lewis has ever given in his entire life. Every time he's even in a movie, without even seeing the film, the Oscar you know, um, the guys who do the uh, the odds on the Oscars are already penciling in Daniel Day-Lewis because you just have to assume because he's going to be in a film this year and he only does one like every four or five years. But when Daniel Day-Lewis does a film, he is going to be, if not the best that year, he's going to be one of the best that year. The difference between a Pacino and De Niro and a Daniel Day-Lewis is consistency. That's the magic word here. And, and as much as I love Al Pacino, when he's on his game. And as much as I love Robert De Niro, when he's on his game, they are amongst the best to have ever lived, but they are not always on their game, especially in the past 15 years or so. And Daniel Day-Lewis, you just can't point out a film where he wasn't on his game. You cannot point to something that he's going to be in where he's not going to be the perennial favorite to win the Oscar that year. He's just that elite. He's just on that level. And I believe the magic word consistency is the thing that separates, you know, a, a Denzel Washington, an Al Pacino, a Robert De Niro, guys like that from a guy like a, like a Daniel Day-Lewis, even from guys like Tom Hanks, who is one of the all-time greats, Jack Nicholson, one of the all-time greats, but nobody has done it like Daniel Day-Lewis on that consistent of a level. It's just incredible. Who would be some of your actors that you might want to consider you'd throw into a, a discussion like that? Well, it's funny. As, I, as, I'm, <laughs> as I'm looking at this question, you know, and, and, and reading this, I'm, I'm thinking there's so many different ways this can be answered, you know, yeah, because yeah, it's true. it also depends on, because on, for me, range is big. You know, what this, yeah, what this yeah. actor has, has offered in range throughout their career. And it depends on who you ask and, and what's on their radar. Because for me... I have so much respect for Daniel Day-Lewis. I mean, just the movies that he's done have just been phenomenal. But his movies are not always on my range as the ones that I'm always going to the theater to see. Right. So I think that, you know, to, for this question, you know, for this type of question, it's like, well, who do you go see consistently the most and who falls in there for you? Because for a girl like me, I love Harrison Ford. You know, yep. but some people might say, well, no, he's not, you know, one of the all time greats. But to me, he is because I run <laughs> to the theater every time there's a Harrison Ford, you know, um, film. So. I think it just kind of depends on that. And you know what? Range is a big one, too, because if we're going to talk about range, um, and this is, I've said this my entire career, folks. I'm not just doing it because it's timely. Range, I don't know that we've ever had an actor that has shown us more range than Robin Williams. Four-time Academy Award nominee, one-time Academy Award winner, would have won another Academy Award if he didn't happen to be in, nominated the same year that Michael Douglas was nominated for Wall Street. Um, he would have won, had a second Oscar on his man like that. This, go to, this guy could do the wildest of comedy and the most deadly serious of villains. This dude, Robin Williams, I bring this part up all the time, was in a movie with Al Pacino in uh, Christopher Nolan's Insomnia. He was in a movie with Al Pacino and completely upstaged Al Pacino. Who can do that? I submit to you that's only been done twice in the history of Hollywood where Al Pacino's been in a movie with somebody that completely upstaged them. One was Robin Williams in Insomnia. The other one was Russell Crowe in The Insider. Other than that, can't be done. Um, so if you're going to talk about range, yes. my goodness, Robin Williams. Was yeah, and, and, and also looking at some of the actors that are on here because I think of... Uh, uh, when Robert De Niro, you know, and he's, his range has been wide, but he did this little film, Hide and Seek, which yeah, yeah. was dark, you know, and it kind of took him to that dark place. And we've seen him in like Cape Fear and other things like that where it's been dark. But that little film that didn't do, I mean, it wasn't even a film that did like anything big, yeah. but it was just, you know, seeing him get that sinister and that evil. And I'd like to kind of see Tom Hanks play that role, play it like a role that's very dark and just something unexpected. I would love to see Tom Hanks do a 
Robin Williams in One Hour Photo oh. kind, kind of role, right? Wouldn't it be cool to see Tom Hanks do something I like that? I loved One Hour Photo and yeah. seeing him just take on that type of character after seeing him be so silly and almost backflip, you know, right. in other movies. Yeah, it, uh, that would be amazing. All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay. Miguel Argueta writes, <laughs> Hello, sons and daughters of AMC. Been watching for about a year now. Great work. Keep it up. Thank you so much. Now on, my, on to my question. What happened with the film stretch with Patrick Wilson and Chris Pine? I know Universal pulled it for some reason, yet I haven't heard anything since. Thanks, and bring on the delicious filthiness that is movie talk. Um, okay, hold on a second. I'm, uh, I'm going to bring this up because I want to make sure I get all the facts on this right. Here's the thing about stretch. So Stretch was this movie. It was supposed to come out, I believe, originally either January or March of 2014. It was supposed to come out at the beginning of this year. All right. And it's about um, you got these two guys. You got Chris Pine, obviously, from Star Trek fame. Uh, you got Ray Liotta was in it. Patrick Wilson was the was the other one of the lead guys in it. Uh, Jessica Alba was in it. Um, so it, Randy, the natural couture, my hero, was in it. Um, so a lot of people in it. And it's about this guy played by Chris Pine who ends up getting ordering a limousine or something. And the limousine driver is played by Patrick Wilson. Something obviously is tends to happen in movies. Something goes wrong uh, and, and something crazy happens. OK, so this movie gets made. It's directed by Joe Carnahan, who also directed uh, The Grey um, with uh, uh, Liam Neeson, which was just awesome and spectacular. And he was lined up to do the next Daredevil movie for Fox before Fox let the rights lapse back to uh, Marvel on Daredevil. But they had this little movie and they were banking on it. And I think they were banking on Chris Pine really drawing people in to see it. But then what happened was that Chris Pine, uh, Jack, um, uh, 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 what's the character played by Harrison Ford in all the spy movies? Uh, I got to look it up now. <laughs> Clear and present danger. I can't believe I'm forgetting this off the top of my head. Clear and present danger. All of you guys at home watching this now are like yelling at me saying, John, it's <laughs> Jack, Jack, Jack Ryan. Thank you. Uh, so Chris Pine was the new Jack Ryan, right? And so the new Jack Ryan film comes out and it bombs. Well, now suddenly Universal has this movie stretch that they were kind of banking on marketing around Chris Pine, but he just had a film that bombed audiences weren't running out to see it just because Chris Pine was in it. And I thought Jack Ryan was actually a pretty good looking movie. And I actually didn't think the movie was all that bad. Was it as good as I was hoping? Clearly not. But so here's the thing. So then universal pulls stretch from their release schedule and they said, we're not going to release this. Okay. Uh, so Carnahan and the producers try to get, get some something done. So universal then says, you know what? We're releasing you you are free to go and find another distributor. So we're going to release you. You have the freedom to go find another distributor. And I remember at that point, a lot of us thought, oh, okay, well, now somebody's going to pick it up. I mean, you got a great cast in there. It sounds like an interesting film. Somebody's going to pick this up. Nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it. Even for clearance house discount prices, nobody wanted stretch. And so eventually it came back to Universal and the last thing I heard was a couple of months ago, I heard the producer saying that, yeah, yeah, it's, it won't be a wide release, but it's going to get released. It'll probably be a limited release, probably more like 100 theaters instead of 3,000 theaters, but whatever. But it's going to come out. It's going to come out. That's all well and good, but I still have seen no plans for Stretch Get Released. The last I heard was a statement by Universal saying they were exploring creative options. So what that sells me is that Stretch may wind up, you know, on a Hulu screen near you soon or a Netflix soon. I, I think this movie's dead in the water. At some point, Universal is going to try to recoup some money from this. And, and you know, it's going to be on, you know, VOD or, you know, in a red box near you or in the Walmart $1 bin. But uh, I, I think the, the chances for a Stretch in a theater near you uh, window are gone. I, I don't think it's going to happen. So there's that. Well, Netflix might be a good move for it. Netflix might be like the only move for it. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know that what it has left other yeah. than that. I mean, look, it's still Chris Pine, right? Mm -hmm. It's still Patrick Wilson. It's still Jessica Alba. I mean, there's some name recognition that on a VOD title might attract people, but VOD does not make the money theaters no, make. Not it's enough. just, 
it's just it's unfortunately this is going to be an unmitigated disaster for everybody involved yeah, this is true all right what's next all right felix <laughs> calciato writes should we judge a movie by its trailer look at transformers 4 it had an awesome trailer but it was a horrible movie i know taste <laughs> is subjective but transformers 4 was a really bad movie. <laughs> Edge of Tomorrow didn't have a great trailer, but because you guys were talking a storm about it, I went to see it and loved it. Isn't judging a movie by its trailer the same as judging a book by its cover? Plus, aren't trailers made by a different company than the movie studio making the movie? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, sometimes, that's exactly. Sometimes a, a studio will send out um, uh, you know, footage, whatever, to a company that specializes in making trailers and they make trailers. And sometimes it's done in-house, but either way. I always have this argument with people and here's the thing. Whenever the topic of film critics comes up, a lot of people thinking they sound smart goes, yeah, I don't listen to film critics. I decide for myself if I want to see a movie and then I'll follow. Oh, well, okay. That's, that's very admirable. That's great. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? You decide for yourself. Like what, what goes into your decision making process? And they go, I, it's simple. I watch the trailers. I decide if it looks good to me. And if so, then I'll go see it. And that sounds great and all. But then when I try to explain to them, it's like, okay, so what you're telling me is you won't listen to these third party, unbiased, have nothing to gain whether you do or don't see a movie film critics. They have nothing to gain from if you go see the movie, if you don't see the movie. They don't care. They have nothing to gain from it. So you're telling me you're going to ignore their impartial reviews of it agree or disagree you're gonna ignore that but you will listen to your corporate masters because you know who makes the trailers right it's the studios who make the trailers the people who are do have a say they do have something to gain by you plopping down your money to go and see it they are not unbiased in this they desperately want you to come and give them your money so when you say to me, no, I don't listen to the critics. I'm smart enough that I just watch trailers inside for myself. You've got to understand what you're saying is I only listen to my corporate masters. I only listen to the corporations who are putting that trailer together with nothing but the exclusive purpose of trying to convince me, AKA sucker me, trying to convince me to give them my money and go see the movie. Because look, you're listening to somebody. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're listening to the critics. It doesn't matter if you're just listening to the trailers. It doesn't matter if you're just listening to, to you're listening to somebody. You're not just deciding for yourself. You are taking in information from some source somewhere to help you make your decision. And you can either listen to impartial third party people who have nothing to gain, whether you go see a movie or not, in, in this case, the critics. And there's a, there's a whole thing about going, finding the right critic for you and the right set of critics for you. Absolutely. Cause all critics are completely different. Um, or you can listen to the voice of the corporation, the mega billion dollar mega machine whose sole existence is to convince you to go see the movie. So who are you listening to? Uh, me personally, like put it this way. Um, if you're going to buy a car and you're going to drop $40,000 on a car, <coughs> Do you just base your decision on Ford's new commercial? I, I only listen to the commercial. I just let Ford tell me if I should buy the Ford car. Or do you do what most people do, most intelligent, sane people do? You jump online, you read some reviews, you read what car and driver is saying about the car, you're reading all the specs and you, re you look into it and you make an informed decision based on third-party people who have nothing to gain about whether you do or don't buy that car. Clearly, you, because it's a lot, $40,000 is a lot of money. You're going to go and read reviews. You're going to read what does car and driver have to say about it? What does this publication have to say about it? Is this a good value for my dollar? Are there better options? Whatever. You're not just going to listen to the commercial that Ford puts in front of you. But a lot of times that's what people tell me they do with movies. And that to me, look, and if that works for you, I, I forgive me if that sounded, sounded condescending. I know it sounded condescending and I apologize for that. Um, if it works for you, great. That works for you. But for somebody like me, that just does not make sense. My, I just can't wrap my head around that kind of logic that, nope, not going to listen to third party people. I'm only going to listen to the corporation that stands to gain by me going to see it. So I don't know, but, but Justin, let me ask you as a more casual film goer, mm -hmm. what are some of the deciding factors for you about what makes, you know, in Jocelyn's head go, yes, Jocelyn wants to see this. You know what? Most of the time it's 
who's in it. I mean, honestly, it's who's in it. And a lot of people are like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I kind of look at who is in it. Is it a new <laughs> upcoming actor? Is it someone that I know really well? The other thing is, I mean, you're absolutely right, and I agree with you. These corporations and big movie studios, I mean, sometimes they contract out to make these trailers and everything, but you have to remember, it's advertising. Yeah. That's basically what it is. It's advertising. It's trying to get you to go and see this movie. And the last movie that I saw where I actually liked the trailer, and, you know, you guys might be mad and throw things, you know, at the screen, but, um, you know, was Elysium. And I liked the. Tra- I, I did not like Elysium. I didn't like it at all. And I loved the trailers. I loved the trailer. When I saw the trailer, I was like, "Cool, you know, it's twenty one fifty four. Like, there's this planet." And I mean, I thought it was. I was Matt like, Damon. Matt Damon. It, you know, it couldn't have been better. I was just like, "Wow!" I went to the theater, totally and utterly disappointed by it. So yeah, for me, the trailer is not the full thing. And I agree with you, Felix. Uh, Transformers Four, awesome trailer. Also, the movie you saw with me. We saw Transformers Four together. Awesome. We were supposed trailer, to but... do a spoilers review for Transformers Four. Jocelyn came around, came along with me and the the crew, and we all went in to watch Transformers Four. All kind of excited about it. <laughs> Woohoo! Can't we see it? And like all seven of us, yeah. we came out of the theater. And seriously, we came out of the theater and we stood around the lobby and we were just like. What what the F did we just watch? We were in mourning. We were in mourning. It was like, <laughs> that is one of the most horrible things I've seen all year. Like, it was just terrible. Yeah. And we're like, uh, like, here's a great example. Everybody knows how much, once again, if you like the Star Wars prequels, that's great. But you know why I hate them, right? Phantom Menace. The trailer to the Phantom Menace is one of the all-time greatest trailers ever made. I, I still, to this day, as, as trashy as the movie is, to this day, I'll say that is one of the best trailers ever made. I still get excited watching the trailer and just pretend like the movie doesn't exist uh, in my head because it's worth getting excited about. It's just, but that's what trailers are there to do. And I don't fault the studios for that. That's their job. Right. And I'm as, I guess, as excited about trailers as anybody else. Oh, yeah. I love watching trailers. I love trailers. I can trailers. spend the day just watching trailers. They're great. But I don't know if that's going to carry me to go see a movie. I, yeah. I don't know if it's enough because I know what you're trying to do. You're going like this to me. Yeah. And I get it. But, you know, I'm not always pleased when I get you there. You look like so. a little bit like a pedophile, doing that, I? by the way. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Well, listen, that will do it. Uh, that's all the questions we had for today. Thank you so much for joining us on this installment of ANC Mailbag. Listen, don't forget, if you've got a question or a comment you'd like us to, br- to bring up on AMC Mailbag or AMC Movie Talk sometime, just email us at this address, at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. We take questions on Mailbag. We take questions on AMC Movie Talk. We get over a thousand questions a week, so don't be, you know, don't be disappointed if or downtrodden if your question doesn't get picked. We can only get to about thirty or forty of them in a week. But send in your question, take your chances, so we can get that. Also, don't forget, lots of great movies playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater showtime and movie ticket information. And if you've got Twitter. You can tweet questions to AMC Movie Talk on a daily basis. Follow us at AMC Movie News. I want to thank my lovely guest today, Miss Jocelyn Polite. Jocelyn, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter at Jocelyn Polite. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. And, of course, you guys can find me on all the various social media channels just at John Campia. That'll do it for us. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. And until next time, bye-bye.